Check one, check one. Can everyone hear me? We are live. I'm here with Anthony Rogers. I am going to wait a few seconds just so I can see if we actually pop up. There's about a 20 to 30 second delay when we can see if everything is uh, running. Looks like it is. All right, everyone take a few seconds to send out this link on Twitter and Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell people I'm live right now. Um, Anthony, if you want to go ahead and send that out too. Now. Paste. And. All right, that's going out. All right, everyone. Um, <clears throat> let me see in the comments if our audio levels are clear. Me. Now the, uh, the streaming cut out. Oh, did it? Yeah, yeah, cut out for a couple seconds. That is huh. interesting. Hey, Arbiter Odie. Hey, everyone. Hey, interesting. All right, let's see if we got that fixed. I'm still seeing the little delay circle here. Huh, I don't um, see it on my end. All right, everyone, is we're going to try and deal with this technical difficulty here at the beginning. That way, hopefully, things are going smooth later. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, uh, since you're doing that, I uh, noticed DBZ in the the text says it's recited Ahad and not Ahadun. He's referring to uh, Surah 112. I pointed out in a discussion with Vocab on his show that when Muhammad Hijab cited Surah 112, uh, the statement, the first line where it says, say he is uh, Allah the One, uh -huh. that it's actually grammatically incorrect in Arabic. It's actually one of, Ahadun. And what I thought was funny was not only was Muhammad Hijab uh, saying it incorrectly, but so was everybody in the audience. So it's interesting, you know, that they all recite it accurately, uh, but the text of the Quran is written inaccurately. Mm -hmm. Right, well, this is interesting. We are, uh, I'm not going to continue here until we, uh, until we fix the, uh, until we fix the live stream. This thing does keep zoom, uh, zoning out here is that something that can only be on your end or is there something it's it's not no no, no it's not your end or, or just you would be going out you would be going out talking to me i wouldn't be going out talking uh hmm. um <laughs> huh? I'm just looking at some of the comments. Well, we got 500 people on here. Um, and vocab says you guys seem fine. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about the uh, the technical difficulty here. I have uh, I have two computers open, so maybe they were that together. They were using up too much of the internet. Um, yeah, it says my levels are fine. So let's uh, let's go ahead and see. Uh, if, DBZ. <laughs> What's that? DBZ is going off in the in the text saying that uh, I'm wrong, but he's stating exactly what I said. <laughs> oh, so you're wrong? So he's wrong? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right, uh, everyone, uh, just uh, realize that for some reason we are having a technical difficulty. This hasn't happened the, uh, the past several times um, I've been live streaming, but it is a weekend, so maybe people, uh, maybe more people are on online right now. Uh, in my area, so I don't know. Um, all right, so we are going to talk about something uh, that is really, I think, one of the most important topics that isn't quite addressed as much as it should be in modern Christian apologetics, and namely that is the plurality in the divine nature in the Old Testament. Now, why we're we, this is important enough that that we could talk. We should be talking about it. Uh, very regularly, but um, we're going to talk about it now because it was an issue in the recent debate. Uh, remember, Muhammad Hijab in the debate set up, he set up uh, the Old Testament as a kind of standard. Hey, why doesn't the Old Testament teach the doctrine of the Trinity? Why is the Old Testament a Unitarian document? He quoted the Shema and so on. 
Um, why don't Jewish uh, thinkers understand the uh, why, why don't they take the position of the, the doctrine of the Trinity is very common uh, position to take in uh, Islamic apologetics. They uh, they are convinced that Judaism and the Old Testament are on their side. They're on the side of Islamic monotheism. And that may not be correct. And why this is important as far as the, the debate is concerned, um, I brought up a quotation from a Jewish scholar who said that back in the day this was understood. And so that the doctrine of the Trinity would fit quite comfortably, um, fit in quite comfortably with early Jewish belief. Uh, not after the end of the second century when there was this swing towards Unitarianism. Um, and why this is important is there are two kinds of issues here. One, what does the Old Testament teach? Does the Old Testament teach um, a kind of divine plurality? And two, what was the understanding of uh, pre-second century Jews? Now think about this. If Muhammad Hijab sets up the Old Testament as a kind of standard for later revelations. Your later revelations can't be inconsistent with the Old Testament. Well, if there is a plurality within the Godhead, according to the Old Testament, that fits right in with the doctrine of the Trinity. So the, the Trinity wouldn't be inconsistent with that. But Islamic Unitarianism would be inconsistent with that. And therefore, if the Old Testament does teach a plurality and Muhammad Hijab has acknowledged this as an authority for theology, then Islam would be falsified by the Old Testament, not Christianity. And so that's kind of why this is. And when, when I brought that up, when I said, no, it's, it's understood, uh, it's understood by uh, contemporary st scholars that there, there was a widespread Jewish belief in a plurality within the one God. Um, before the, the end of the second century, his response was, ah, you know, but it doesn't say Trinity. Well, that's true. They're not, they're not giving uh, a, a clear doctrine of the Trinity, but that misses the point, right? He's setting up the Old Testament and Jewish understanding as authoritative over later revelations. Therefore, if there is a plurality, this refutes Islamic Unitarianism. It doesn't refute Christianity. It would allow it would allow for further revelation, clarifying exactly what the plurality is. But a plurality within the one nature of God would refute Islam. So the question we're going to address uh, now during this live stream is uh, one: what, Is there a plurality within God according to the Old Testament? And two. Is that how the Jews understood it? Is that how um, early Jews uh, understood their theology? So uh, I have here someone who studied this extensively, and I'm here with Anthony Rogers. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, the video you uh, you posted yesterday on uh, on my well, or was that early this morning? Anyway, video on the great Muhammad Hijab. And you didn't seem too impressed with his knowledge of, of Hebrew there. No, no. And, of course, it's uh, it's quite significant because he made so much of the fact that you were referring to Arabic. Now, in the first place, it's not a problem for you to make reference to certain uh, Arabic terms or phrases, right? I mean, today we have a lot of things at our disposal. We can access things mm -hmm. uh, that people didn't have easy access to in the past. And as you pointed out in the debate, you could easily cite Arab-speaking uh, Muslim scholars mm -hmm. who were affirming your point. And so it was simply, I think, a, a, a cheap observation to say, oh, you don't know Arabic. But, but it was the height of hypocrisy for him to then turn around and start trying to pontificate on Hebrew when uh, I included in the video every single reference that I saw in the debate to Hebrew on his part. And there wasn't a single statement he made regarding Hebrew where he didn't make one or two mistakes in the same breath. And so that's that's quite remarkable. Uh, so, if he's saying, but by the way, there, 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 there always seems to be double standards here, right? <laughs> Namely, uh, not just the, hey, you can't speak about Islam unless you are fluent in Arabic, even if you're even if you're citing. Uh, Muslim scholars and Muslim translators who are saying the exact same thing that you do. Uh, you just can't comment on these things. Um, it never occurs to them that, hey, following that same reasoning, I can't talk about the Old Testament or the New Testament. Um, but but two, uh, you have to be extremely precise in everything you say about Arabic or you're in trouble. 
and you can't be trusted. But if you just blather on and, and spout complete nonsense about Hebrew or Greek, I'm not just referring to, to Muhammad Hijab. This is a widespread um, inconsistency in Islam. Um, but you can just make up complete nonsense about Hebrew and Greek. And even if you get called out for it, even if you get refuted, Muslims don't regard it as a problem that you did all of that, right? In other words, uh, Muhammad Hijab is not going to get in any trouble from his fellow Muslims or from his fellow Muslim apologists for getting almost everything he says about Hebrew wrong. It's just not, it's just not an issue for them. Right, right. And if you look at the video, the comments from Muslims, uh, n none of them seem to have any problem with the fact that he was... Uh, now, I don't know that you would agree with me going this far, but I, I'm not uh, shy to say it. Uh, in my view, he's simply lying in many cases uh, about the Hebrew. I'm not saying he never made any, it wasn't, you know, simple mistakes in some cases, but when he's pretending to know Hebrew, remember, he's, he said you can't comment on a language unless you know it. And so if he's speaking about Hebrew and he's being consistent with himself, then he must know Hebrew by his own strictures. And so when he says things about Hebrew and every single statement is wrong, then I can't draw any other conclusion than that he's simply making things up. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that also he, he went a step further than saying that if you don't speak fluent Arabic, then you can't comment on Arabic. He's actually saying that if you don't speak Arabic, then you can't quote a scholar of Arabic, because <laughs> remember in the debate you did, and he, he didn't seem to think that that was acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the standards on the Islamic side are just... Uh, uh, you know, completely lopsided compared to what uh, they would allow to themselves. Yeah, so uh, um, not overly consistent group there. Um, no. All right, so how do you want to start um, as far as addressing the plurality um, of God within the Old Testament? So I, I understand there, there are a few different ways you can uh, break it down. You could, in theory, go, you know, book by book or section by section or something like that. Uh, but probably easier to go, you know, topic by topic. Um, what is one sort of category of uh, of, of evidence? Yeah, well, I, I think first what I would do is say that uh, because uh, Muslims are confused on this point, uh, first say that monotheism is not equivalent to Tawhid or Islamic Unitarianism. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake that uh, Muhammad Hijab kept making and all of the Muslims were just going along with it. Theism itself, uh, you know, uh, uh, monotheism is a subset of theism, right? There are other forms of theism. You have polytheism, you have henotheism, other kinds of theism. Well, in the same way, monotheism has several subsets. You have Unitarianism, the idea that God is one person, and Trinitarianism, the fact that God is tripersonal. Simply trying to reduce uh, monotheism to Unitarianism shows no understanding of the meaning of the term and certainly no understanding of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And, and I bring this up not only because he tried to equate uh, Tawhid with uh, monotheism, but because he then proceeded to cite passages of the Old Testament that say God is one as if that was establishing his point mm -hmm. and disestablishing the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, no. uh, Anthony, have you ever... <laughs> When, when they tell us that God is one or that there's one God, have you ever met a Christian who denies that, that God is one? No, I, I, and I've never even flinched. I, I, you know, when they say uh, God is one, it's not like I say, oh, really? You know, well, thank, thank you. Thank before. you for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean, but you remember, mean monotheism is true? Yeah. He, he quotes the uh, Shema, Shema Yisrael, where, you know, uses the word Echad. Uh, and he quoted the first commandment where it says, have no other gods bef uh, before me or besides me. And I think he also made a reference to Isaiah, maybe Isaiah 43.10, or, or one of those uh, monotheistic passages. Those are all passages we would affirm. Those are passages that Christians were affirming before uh, Muhammad was even a glimmer in his father's eye. I mean, that, uh, before Muhammad was even on the scene, Christians were affirming the unity of God. It's asserted in the New Testament. Paul says God is one in Romans 3. James says even the demons know that God is one in James 2. So no Christian denies that God is one. The, the question is whether the one God exists in a plurality of person. That is within the nature of God. Mm -hmm. Are there these personal distinctions? And you pointed out in the debate that uh, Muslims have to admit that, that one is not the only thing you can say about Allah. Right there, there are other senses in which you have to speak of a plurality. If nothing else, Muslims affirm that Allah has a plurality of attributes. Right, so one uh, 
is is something they're affirming in relation to one thing, but but his attributes have to be spoken of as many, and it's, you're speaking there, as you said, on the level of attributes, right? Mm-hmm. You have being and attributes. And so uh, it, it's simply not adequate to say the Bible says God is one, therefore there's not a plurality of persons. By that reasoning, we could say God is one, therefore he doesn't have a plurality of attributes, right? Mm-hmm. Now, and one, then, and, and, and if, we, if we did... Uh, and notice, he, he's laying this down as contradiction, right? It's a contradiction to say that God is one in one sense and more than one in another sense. Well, if that's the case, then we know that, as you pointed out, Allah would be uh, one in one sense, more than one in another sense. But uh, Allah's attributes can be in conflict, right? My mercy uh, triumphs over my wrath. So there can be a conflict between his attributes. So there is clearly a plurality within the one God. If that's a contradiction, then... Islam is false. Um, and so, I don't know, we could say Islam is false right. according to um, according to Muhammad Hijab because it, it you, you do have a oneness and a plurality uh, within Allah. And if that's a contradiction, then then Islam is false. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, there are also a number of uh, incredible difficulties that arise from the Islamic way of trying to work out Allah's attributes and nature. Uh, one real quick without, I don't want to get too far off and, and not give the evidence for the Trinity, but the, uh, one thing that you'll hear some Muslims say is that Allah exists in heaven, right? Not on earth. And then when you say, well, there are these passages that, that speak of Allah being closer to you than you, his, uh, your jugular vein or, or something along those lines. And what Muslims will sometimes say is, well, that, uh, Allah is above the seven heavens, right? He's on top of the throne carried by eight angels. Uh, but his attribute of seeing is here, right? So, so here you have this bifurcation between Allah and his attributes, right? It's not just a distinction. Allah's in heaven atop, uh, the throne while his attributes somehow are present, right? That, that, uh, is, that goes beyond simply making a distinction and almost seems to suggest there's a cleavage between Allah and his attributes. And if there's this vast separation between them that Allah's transcendent, his attributes are imminent, then uh, you, you, the, they don't even seem to really be attributes that describe Allah, right? Because Allah and his attributes are divorced in, in some sense. Mm-hmm. And so what is Allah after all? But anyways, um, so yeah, th- there's a there's a fundamental uh, mistake in saying you can't have both unity and diversity in God uh, simply because there's only one God. Both Muslims and Christians affirm that God is one in many, though in two different senses. And uh, so uh, it, there's no logical problem there. Mm-hmm. So the, and, the, the, the passages, the, pa- the Old Testament passages, um, which say that God is one, we would, as you pointed out, agree with those, that God is one. And so the real question is whether that allows for a kind of plurality within that one God. Right, right. And so uh, as far as passages go, we could first of all speak in a very broad way about the fact that the Old Testament uh, indicates that there is some kind of personal plurality within mm-hmm. the Godhead. I think in the debate you brought up Genesis 126. Uh, I know you brought up certain passages. I'm not. I don't recall for sure if that's one, but that was one of the passages you could have brought, uh, brought I did up. Bring up 126. Yeah. Okay. So there in that passage, God said, "Let us make man in our image," and this can't be written off as God uh, speaking to the angels because here you're talking about creation, right? Let us make man in our image. Not only did the angels not create anything, they don't have the power to create. And if Muslims want to say they were involved in the work of creation, then they're committing shirk. But we also weren't made in the image of angels. Uh, angels are not image bearers. Image uh, image bearers, uh, that's a distinct or unique uh, uh, feature of humanity. That's why mankind was destined to be exalted above the angels, as it says in Psalm 8. Uh, so it, this can't be a reference to angels. But it also can't be written off as a plural of majesty. In the first place, uh, the phrase let us make, that's a verb in Hebrew. It's a plural uh, verb. Uh, and there, there's no such thing as a plural of majesty used with verbs in Hebrew. That's pointed out by one scholar after another. Uh, and uh, uh, I just know that uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab doesn't want to try and comment here on uh, on the Hebrew since we've already seen that his Hebrew skills are, are less than uh, adequate. But uh, well, he could, make, he could make something up, right? Yeah, yeah, he could. He was throughout the debate. But um, the uh, so you have this phrase, let us make, and it, it's not a plural of majesty. No Hebrew scholar would say that today. 
and it's not a reference to angels. It's a reference to divine persons who are active in the creation, which is significant because contextually you already have a reference, and you did, I recall, point the debate, a reference to God and his spirit. Right, the spirit is there in verse two, brooding over the creation. Which uh, the, the language there, the idea is that the spirit is there, superintending things. He's upholding the creation, and it, that's explicitly stated in, in places like Psalm thirty three six uh, by the, the the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their starry hosts by His spirit or the spirit of His mouth. Uh, Psalm one hundred four thirty, where it says, "You send forth your spirit, and they are created." Right, numerous passages in Scripture speak of the spirit creating. Uh, so the plurality contextually includes at least God and his spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, we would also say that it includes God's word, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll bring up some stuff on that uh, later. But um, So that's just one of many passages that indicates plurality, and it's not the only time it occurs in Genesis. Yeah, well, it, it just, I mean, it's kind of significant that this is all happening in the first chapter of the, of the book, right? This is, this is how, how everything starts off. In the Jewish and Christian scriptures is, hey, just so you guys know, there is a plurality within the one God. And it starts off like that from the very beginning. Very strange for a book that is Unitarian in nature. Right. And then it's only two chapters later, chapter three, after man sins, where God does it again. And he says, behold, the man has now become like one of us. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh Again, it's, plural. it's, it's plural. And what's interesting is in the very context, again, you have a, some indication of what this plurality includes. Because you read that Adam, and, Adam heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. That's a, an incredible phrase. It doesn't say he heard God walking in the garden. It's not, I mean, it's, it's a fuller phrase. He heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. This was one of those passages that Jews, and we'll talk about the Jewish evidence later, but this is one of those passages that Jews looked to and, and started to, uh, speak of the plurality as including God's word. His, mm-hmm. in Aramaic, the word is memra. In Greek, it's logos. You know, uh, and, and a lot of people will recognize already that's the language that John uses in his gospel, right? John was a Jew. John wasn't just pick, uh, making this stuff up out of midair like uh, Muhammad Hijab with Hebrew meanings. This, uh, John is a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he's familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, with rabbinic teaching, and, and, he, and he's not using a foreign concept, right? He's using this title that was well known to the Jews, but if he wasn't using a well-known title to them, then he would have defined it. He would have given some explanation of what this title is, where it comes from. But instead, he just, right out of the chute, right, in his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, you know, no no explanation or, or anything. Uh, and that's because, again, this is a, a deeply uh, uh, grounded uh, tr- uh Jewish concept. Well, but then again, you have this same thing happening in Genesis eleven seven at the Tower of Babel when the uh, builders say, "Let us build a tower." Then you have the divine response to that, saying, uh, "Let us go down and there confound their language." Right? The people say, "Let us build a tower," and the Lord says, "Let us destroy it." Basically. Now, if you want to say that's just a plural of majesty, then are you going to say that the tower builders was just you know when they said, "Let us build a tower," that was just guy, a- yeah. Yeah, just one guy's building this huge city. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's it's a personal plurality. Uh, God is coming down in judgment, and that God is defined with the use of a, a plural term. Now, when I say, if I say pronoun, I'm simply referring here to the, the English translation. But, of course, again, in, in Hebrew, there are different terms that are being used, sometimes verbs, sometimes nouns. Uh, but... Uh, and then uh, another passage, just to, to round this part of the discussion off, uh, another passage is Isaiah 6, 8. In Isaiah 6, 8, Isaiah has a vision of the Lord seated upon his throne. And then the angels significantly cry out that God is thrice holy, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then when that thrice holy God speaks, how does he speak? Does he speak like a Unitarian deity, like a unipersonal deity, or does he speak as a plurality of persons? Well, the answer is in verse 8. The Lord said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Right. That singular I is also a plural us. 
And and that's the God of Isaiah. That's the God the angels are crying out is, is, is holy three times. That's the God that Isaiah is being sent by. Now, now here you have, uh, I know we're talking about the Old Testament, but it's, again, significant to observe that the New Testament authors look to this and interpret it in a Trinitarian way, right? When John refers back to this passage in John 12, he says, he quotes Isaiah 6, the, the words of God to Isaiah in, in Isaiah 6, and he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw Christ's glory and spoke of him. Mm-hmm. So John says that Isaiah saw Jesus in Isaiah 6. Furthermore, Paul in Acts 28 quotes the same passage that John does from Isaiah 6, and he said the voice that Isaiah heard was that of the Holy Spirit. So here you have New Testament authors identifying this divine plurality as including the Son and the Spirit. Jewish, Uh, Jewish New Testament authors. Right, and it gets even better because if you look at the Jewish Targums, and I'll say more about the Targums later too, when the Targums paraphrase this, the, the Targums, for those that don't know, were Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament. Basically, uh, what those were is, uh, in, the, in the first century, Jews uh, predominantly weren't speaking Hebrew as their, as their main language uh, because of their captivity and other things that happened in their history. And, and so what would happen is the, a, a person would stand up in the synagogue and read the Hebrew text. So a rabbi had to know Hebrew, but then he would interpret it for the people in Aramaic. And those Aramaic paraphrases are what we call the Targums. Well, in the Targums, and again, these are first century books. Christians had nothing to do with composing these books. In the Jewish Targums, it says that the one whom Isaiah saw was the Memra, the word of the Lord, the Logos, the same person John identifies with Jesus. And so over and over again in the Old Testament, quite apart from the New, you have God speaking in the plural number, and you have at least, so far from what we've seen, contextual indicators showing that this includes God's word and spirit. Now, so, hang on, a little, little, little side note there, right? So you're saying Old Testament. Old Testament, you have you have God, but then you you clearly have reference to His Word and His Spirit, which are clearly divine. Yes. Okay. Now that we yeah. know. Now you know. You know why why I find that interesting is in Islam, right? In Islam, they say that Allah's word or Allah's speech must be eternal. Um, but the reasons, the arguments that they give for claiming that his word or speech is eternal is because it originates from within him and whatever is a part of Allah or originates from within Allah rather than him simply saying be, out, you know, and then it, it, it comes into existence outside of him. Um, the same reason they give for saying that his speech is eternal would also apply to his spirit, which he breathes out and therefore the spirit would have to, according to the same argument, unless they want to drop the argument and just say his word, his, his word or his speech uh, is created. Um, but if they want to stick with the argument, and, and if they're Orthodox Muslims, they have to, the same reasoning would apply to his spirit. And so you would have Allah, his speech, and his spirit um, as all of them co-eternal. And so right, right off the bat, right off the bat, um, looks like there's some copying going on. Um, looks like there's some copying going on. But what's significant here is if you're saying, uh, no, the Old Testament can't teach that, or uh, no, you don't have this spirit, or no, you you can't say that about the the the, the word of God or something like that, then you know you're st- you're you're starting to undermine Islam as well. Yeah, you, you know what's ironic, and and uh, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I pointed it out in a paper I wrote a long time ago for answering Islam. The phrase that he kept referring to uh, in the debate in order to explain away Jesus being called the word, uh, kun fayakun, uh, the Hebrew word be and it is, right? Uh, numerous times in the Quran it says, Allah says be and it is. He was saying that uh, that's what it means when it says Jesus is his word, right? That Jesus is created. He's the word be, right? God says be and Jesus is. Uh, well, uh, not only is this problematic because then couldn't you just turn around and say, well, then the Quran is created, right? Because uh uh, it's, the Quran's called the word of Allah, so it must be his word be, 
and therefore it's created just like they're saying Jesus was created. That's obviously not the point uh, that Muhammad was making in those in those statements. But but the reason I bring it up now is it, it's interesting to me that phrase. As you know, Muhammad borrowed a lot of things from the Jews that were around him in uh, in Arabia. And that phrase is actually originally found in the Jewish Targums. And so it's it's evidence that uh, that Muhammad is picking these things up because it doesn't come from the Old Testament per se. The concept is in the Old Testament, right? God God says, let there be light, and then there's light. But the, the phrase itself is actually found in the Jewish Targums. But here's why it's so interesting. According to the Jewish Targums, the one who said be is God's word, his memra, right? It's the memra of the Lord who spoke the word be and everything came into existence. It's the word who said that. Uh, so you have here not only evidence of Muhammad borrowing, but it's, it's a, he's borrowing from a book that teaches that God's word is the creator of everything. His personal word, right? Not just uh, some impersonal thing. But, it's but, the word but, who speaks. But by the by the way, um, I didn't fully uh, understand his point about saying that that Jesus is uh, Allah's word because Allah says be and he is. Is, is that what he was actually saying? Because that, yeah, that because, because what I said was, well, God creates me in the same way and therefore I would be the word of God. Right. You're, you're, but your response is still valid uh, because that, you know, what he's saying that uh, he's his word in the sense that Allah said be. So he's that. Uh, he's that spoken. He's what God said, right? He spoke him into existence. I mean, yeah. It's not a very clear uh, argument. Well, well, no, but and notice, fo following that, I mean, again, according to the Quran, that's how Allah creates everything. So right. that's how Allah but, created a pig. So that would right. make that would make a pig the word of Allah. <laughs> so you can point to a pig and say, "Hey, pig!" You can name the pig the the word of Allah, right? Because that that's what it that's what it is, according to Muhammad Hijab. Um, and so I, I don't know. I would encourage Muslims to reject that argument. Otherwise, you can point to to anything. You know, Hitler is the word of Allah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's that's common uh, to hear Muslims say that. I mean, I've heard it a lot, but uh, I don't. I mean, it's not a good argument. Um, so uh, you know, besides uh, that, that was just that's just one line uh, indicating that there's a plurality in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are other passages. One of my favorite texts is in Genesis 19. Now, to fully appreciate this passage, you have to uh, understand the context. The context starts back in Genesis 18, where it says God appeared to Abraham with two angels. And so here you have God and two angels appearing in human form, which is significant enough, right? Muslims say God can't enter into his creation. And here, actually, let me let me throw in something that goes back to what you said at the beginning. Uh, I, Muhammad Hijab was granting, as you said, uh, the Old Testament as a kind of standard. Mm -hmm. Now, I think as soon as he's shown personal plurality in the Old Testament, he'd reject it, right? He'd, he'd just turn around and arbitrarily say, okay, well, then we're not going to listen to the Old Testament anymore. Wait, wait, wait. But, but, but would he still cite it as proof that Muhammad's a prophet? Well, in his next debate, uh, you know, after rejecting it in one, he'd probably turn around and use it in another, right? Uh, or what, you know, what have you. There, there wouldn't be a whole lot of consistency there. But, uh, but I, I think that there, there, you know, it's not just that he accepts it and then could arbitrarily reject it. I think there's a logic there uh, that that uh, makes it uh, unavoidable and undeniable, namely that God is giving His revelation for a reason, mm -hmm. right? It, it's preparatory to what's coming later. He's holding people accountable to what He said as they as they go along, right? And He's preparing them for something. According to Muhammad Hijab, like you just mentioned. He thinks the Old Testament predicts Muhammad, which means that God is giving this revelation, uh, at least on his, even on his terms, uh, he's giving this revelation to prepare the way for something, right? There's, there's no sense in God revealing prophecies about Muhammad if they're all going to be corrupted before Muhammad ever gets here and people are able to recognize him, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the whole point of the prophecy. You know, you're going to recognize, and then the Quran, doesn't it chide Jews and Christians for not accepting Muhammad even though they should have recognized him, right? Mm -hmm. Why should they have recognized him? Well, because they think he's predicted in the Old Testament. Well, that that already suggests that the Old Testament uh, uh, is is preparatory and therefore criteriological, right? It, it's giving a standard that's that's going to be in place and, and should be used, must be used by people uh, at the time, right? And, and, and by the by, by the way, it's uh it's it's authoritative for everyone. Um, in right. uh, in Surah five, verse forty three. Some Jews come to Muhammad 
to settle a dispute. And Allah responds, why did they come to you, Muhammad, when they have the Torah, right? So the Torah, and then it goes on to warn them, whoever, whoever doesn't judge by what Allah has revealed uh, is no better than those who rebel. So according to the Quran, the Torah was still authoritative over Jews. And so we know what the Torah said in, in the seventh century. So uh, that's not in dispute. A few verses later, we got the same thing with, with the gospel. But right now we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the, the Jewish scriptures. But what's interesting is uh, the Jewish scriptures were even authoritative over Muhammad himself. So in Surah 10, verse 94 of the Quran, um, Allah tells Muhammad, Muhammad was having some kind of doubts about his revelations, but uh, Allah tells Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. And so if Muhammad's having doubts, the only way he can confirm his revelations is by going to people who have the previous revelations and making sure that his revelations line up with the prior revelations. But the only way that would happen is if, um, is if they're still reliable uh, and still exist during his time. But notice, if Muhammad can only confirm his revelations by going to uh, by going to the earlier scriptures, then those earlier scriptures are authoritative over Muhammad himself. In other words, uh, Muslims tend to think that that the Quran, you know, that the, the Quran stands in judgment over all the other scriptures. When according to certain passages in the Quran, it's the complete reverse, right? It's it's uh, the earlier scriptures are how you would even know that the Quran is the word of God. And if the Quran doesn't line up with these earlier scriptures, well, so much for the Quran. And so uh, Muslims are, are stuck with, with what we find in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. And so and I, I bring that up, uh, number one, to say that he can't just arbitrarily dismiss the Old Testament or any other Muslim uh, once they find out that it doesn't support their position. Because the logic of it, for one, uh, in the nature of a preparatory word, uh, you know, you can't say that it's it's lost before it does its work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, secondly, for the uh, the other reason is because the the when uh, if a person doesn't first learn from the Old Testament about God, he's not going to understand or believe what the New Testament says. For example. Muslims will say that God can't enter into the world, right? The incarnation is impossible. But the Old Testament has already established that God is not locked out of his creation. And I mean, even the idea that God would create a world that he couldn't enter into strikes me as absurd, right? That's like a person building a house that uh, uh, he's, he's uh, sealed himself out of, right? He, he's, he's made no way for himself to be able to get into the house. Or like some careless, uh, uh, you know, uh, absentee landlord who... Uh, I mean, it just it just strikes me as utterly bizarre uh, to even reason that way. Why would God create a world that he couldn't come into? Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 here in Genesis 18, you have Moses already preparing people for this concept that God can enter into the world. So God in Genesis 18 enters into the world with two angels and speaks with Abraham. And he tells Abraham that he's there for two reasons. Number one, to announce that he's going to have a son, right, that Isaac is going to be born, the son of promise. But then secondly, because of the outcry of Sodom, right, the outcry that has come up to heaven indicating that the, the people of Sodom were guilty of gross sin and were ripe for judgment. So uh, as you move along through the context, you have uh, the two angels leave and go down to Sodom while God remains behind temporarily to speak with Abraham. After God is done speaking with Abraham, he departs and goes down to Sodom, just like he said. Well, then you pick up the narrative in 1924, and remember, God is on earth. He just got through speaking with Abraham, saying, I'm going down to Sodom. And in 1924, it says, the Lord rained down uh, fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Okay, in Hebrew, this is this is very clear. I don't think it's not it's unclear in English, but uh, certainly in Hebrew, you have the, uh, very clearly a distinction. Two persons are being referred to as Lord, one of whom's on earth, the other of whom is in heaven, one of whom is is receiving the fire from the other. Right, the Lord rained fire from the Lord. The preposition there uh, is clear and uh, can't be uh, you know dodged. There's a clear personal distinction here, and both persons are called Yahweh, right? The, the term Lord there in Hebrew is Yahweh. And once again, if you look at the Jewish Targums, what do you think they say? They say it was the Memra of the Lord who was on earth, the word of the Lord, who rained down fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. So here you have God and his word, who in the Hebrew text are both referred to as Yahweh, 
uh, both of whom are personally interacting with each other, right? And one of whom has appeared on earth in the form of a man. Now think about this. I mean, this is beautiful. Prior to the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world and becoming incarnate for our salvation, you have one person coming uh, on behalf of the other and acting on behalf of the other, and he's appearing in human form. What does that sound like? Well, it sure sounds a whole lot like uh, at least Christian concepts, right? Christian mm-hmm. categories. Uh, God appearing on earth in human form and interacting with God in heaven. Now, now uh, uh, that's Anthony, not Islam, right? Anthony, it's not your Islam. Yeah, Anthony. As far as uh, uh, the import of this, right? Uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first cha- This is the first book of the Bible, right? This is he's still in Genesis here, so still in Genesis. That so one. This is in Genesis where you have. Um, at the, at the, in the, in the opening verses, you have God and the Spirit of God. Then you have God speaking of himself repeatedly throughout the book, uh, in these plural terms. And then here you have, uh, God on earth while God is simultaneously in heaven. And this is in his encounter with Abraham, right? Muslims put such an emphasis on Abraham and the religion of Abraham. Well, God appeared in human form to Abraham. And just after that, God, while he is still in this human form, also has God raining down fire from heaven. So this is the religion of Abraham. And does it sound like Islamic Unitarianism uh, to you? So notice that the... The only way to avoid the, the only way to avoid the, the things that you said so far, Anthony, would be to say this is all corrupted. But that's just the, the Quran does not leave it open to Muslims to say, well, the book of Genesis and the Torah has have been corrupted uh, well, so here, that we can bring these in line with Islamic theology. It doesn't leave that open to you. Well, well here's what's uh, additionally humorous about that. If it was corrupted, then it had to have been corrupted by Jews. Right. Mm-hmm. Because we have the scriptures uh, uh, from the Jews prior to they were ever in the hands of Christians. For example, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Mm-hmm. And these, uh, all, all of this language is used. It's all there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, but, but now notice what this would, would mean then. This would mean that there were Jews who believed in a plurality of divine persons within the Godhead before the, uh, the Christians believed this, right? Mm-hmm. But didn't Mah- uh, Muhammad hijab and don't other Muslims say that Jews never believed this? Mm-hmm. You know, so they're only shooting themselves in the foot here. Of course, the scriptures weren't corrupted, but, but number two, if they were, we're talking here about Jews. And this undermines their case that Jews didn't believe in, in divine plurality. Mm-hmm. Why would any Jew come along and make this up if the Jews were Unitarians? Mm-hmm. Uh, it simply doesn't make sense. Um, but what's interesting, and I won't quote these passages, I'll just mention them, but if you, uh, somebody might want to say that the passage in Genesis 1924 uh, is, uh, well, actually, I don't even need to quote passages to make this point, but someone might want to say, <clears throat> Well, this is just, uh, you know, you find elsewhere in Scripture where one person refers to himself in the third person, right? Um, and and the, uh, the problem here is God isn't speaking in Genesis 19.24, right? This is not an example of somebody speaking in the third person. This is a narrative being recorded by Moses. Mm-hmm. Moses says the Lord rained fire from the Lord out of heaven after just saying that the Lord was on earth. And, and so that's the most common response to that, but but that's simply not an adequate response. Uh, but real quickly for the listeners, if they want to put this down, if you look at Isaiah thirteen nineteen, Amos four eleven, and then Jeremiah fifty verse forty, you'll notice that God referring back to this event again makes the distinction between two persons who were there judging Sodom. Read the text closely, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um. A couple other uh, just uh, general passages, uh, I mean, that fit into this idea of a uh, uh, a plurality. Uh, One is in Hosea 1-7, where uh, it's, it's God speaking, and he says, I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them. So remember, it's God speaking. I'll have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God, and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. Mm-hmm. So so here's God speaking about God, who he's going to use to save 
uh, the people of Israel. You know, it's it's a very similar uh, thing to what you see in in Genesis nineteen twenty four, the Lord reigning from the Lord. But again, uh, along these same lines, you have Zechariah two eight through eleven. It, it starts for thus says the Lord of hosts. So it's the Lord speaking, and here's what he says: Thus says the Lord of hosts. After glory, he has sent me against the nations. Wait a minute. Why is the Lord saying he has sent me? Who has sent the Lord against the nations? Okay, but it goes on. It says, for behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plunder for their slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Again, the Lord is speaking and he says, the Lord of hosts has sent me. Oh, but it gets it gets even better. He says, sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. So in this passage, the Lord speaks of the Lord sending him and then says that he's going to come and dwell in the midst of his people. Once again, that does not sound like Islam for two reasons. Number one, there's a personal distinction within the Godhead. Two persons are being referred to as Lord here. And secondly, God speaks of dwelling in the midst of his people, right? Muslims don't believe that's possible. That's why they try and rule out the incarnation. Um, oh, just to throw in something humorous here, uh, the other day I had a, uh, a discussion with a Muslim, and he, he asked me the question, he, and you've, you've probably heard this, uh, you know, uh, does, does your God go to the toilet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and he says, it, or, no, 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 he first started off by saying that your God came out of a woman's private parts, mm -hmm. right? And then he says, does, you, does your God go to the toilet? And so I asked him the question. I said, is your God everywhere? Okay. I said, if you say that he's not everywhere, then your God is finite. And like the pagan gods that all of the prophets rejected, right? The, the God of the prophets was infinite, mm -hmm. right? He transcends heaven and earth, but also is, you know, can't be contained by anything. And so uh, everything is present to him. Nothing can, can escape his presence. Uh, but so if you say he's not omnipresent, then uh, you have a finite God and he's not really God. But if you say he's omnipresent, then you're granting that he's he's present everywhere, including the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Right. And then so so at first he said uh, he said, yeah, God is omnipresent. But he still wanted to say uh, Jesus couldn't become. Oh, and my point was, if God could be everywhere and he's in these places already, then you can't say it's indecent for Jesus to be God and to be born of a, a woman and, and all that stuff. And uh, so he didn't know which way he wanted to go. First, he said that God is everywhere. And then I said, OK, so then the incarnation is possible. There's nothing wrong with Jesus being in those places or doing those things. Uh, but then he said, uh, OK, no, God can't be in those places. So I said, well, then all, all a person has to do. I mean, just think about it, all a person has to do if they want to commit sin is go in the bathroom. Right. Yeah. Allah won't know. Oh, I can't come in there with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's just, a, it, it, it's, it, it's very practical in many ways, right? The, the doctrine of the Trinity, which people want to say is absurd, actually undergirds what we want to say about the kind of world we live in and the fact that it's a moral universe, by which I mean that what we do in every place matters because God is in every place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, God is there, God knows, and God will call us to account. If you don't think he's there, then he can't be uh, uh, aware of it uh, and call you to account. There's no final judgment. Or... If you want to say that he is aware of it, but only because the angels are bringing him the information, how is that any different than the pagans? Mm -hmm. In fact, I laughed in the debate when Hijab was talking about the angels carrying the prayers to, to Allah. Uh, I mean, you might, we could symbolically talk about the angels bearing up our prayers or something like that. I mean, you do get that kind of figurative language in the Bible. But if you want to literally say that God needs the angels to bring things to him, or I mean, that was what the pagans were saying about their gods, right? Mm -hmm. He wanted to say that's what the angels were doing in the case of Muhammad, which makes him the equivalent of their of the pagans deities. Mm -hmm. Right. Muhammad mm -hmm. was supposed to be getting rid of all that. But here is hijab saying, uh, no, no, no. Muhammad just uh, brought it all back in and made himself uh, the God that the pagans were. You know, He displaced their gods and put himself in their place. It's Tawheed, um, man. That's Tawheed for it. Yeah. One. Don't say three. Just say Muhammad, Allah, the Quran. Uh, every chapter of the Quran. <laughs> oh yeah, hey, hey, you, 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 you just said don't say three. I just wanted to uh, uh, wonder if we could comment real quick on uh, the uh, one of the commenters who keeps saying nowhere in the Bible does it say Trinity, right? Apparently, this person hasn't been paying attention to anything we've been we've been saying, right? Uh, you're talking about what the Bible says, right? The word Trinity, the word Trinity is a word that's that's meant to describe what you have in the Bible, right? So the question is, do you have 
one God and a plurality of persons in the Bible. That's what Anthony has been speaking about this entire time. And uh, it's just ridiculously simplistic to say, oh, but where does the word occur? I mean, yeah. the word the word theology is not in the Bible, right? So, so you would say there's no theology in the Bible. There's no theology anywhere in the Bible. The Bible doesn't contain theology because it doesn't use the word theology, right? Now that would be absurd reasoning. So why do you why do you <coughs> say that? Um, uh, why do you say that about the Bible? Why do you say that about the Trinity, right? If if the Bible teaches Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and one God, that's that's just what the word Trinity is meant to describe. So uh, you want to comment on that or just roll on? Yeah, yeah, no, I have something to say on that. Um, you, This goes back again to something you said at the beginning. The stuff we're talking about now is very important because not enough Christians are familiar with it, and Muslims are completely ignorant of it, and so get away with murder in many cases. Well, uh, one of the things we can point out here is, I mean, Christians aren't as, I mean, Muslims are all over the place, don't really understand either, but they at least... Uh, have some words and, and some things they can pull up that uh, that sound like they might know something, right? Like when they say things like uh, the Trinity wasn't, you know, the, the term's not used in the Bible, right? They know to say those sorts of things. Christians don't know to, to return the favor and point out how Muslims have the same thing going on in their circles, right? And, and one of the famous phrases that Muslims use when it, when it comes to discussing Allah's nature and attributes is the phrase bila kaif. Mm. That that phrase means without saying how, mm. without s describing the modality of it, mm. and basically it's uh, it's a statement saying uh, this is beyond our ability mm. to know. It's incomprehensible to us. Only Allah knows mm. what this what this is, right? Uh, and, and but that's not found in the Quran. It doesn't say bila khayf in the Quran, but that's a critical point in Islamic theology. Uh -huh. And, uh, and and it also speaks to the fact that Muslims are simply not being consistent again when they say that uh, you know it's 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 in a, uh, you know that the, the the doctrine of the Trinity is difficult for us to understand mm -hmm. and you know all that kind of stuff or it's paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, if it's if it's difficult and paradoxical, number one, uh, it sounds like we're talking about God then, right? That's the sort of thing you'd expect if you're a finite creature and you're trying to talk about the infinite. Uh, but then two. Uh, Muslims have in the Quran uh, statements that they appeal to whenever they can't explain something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Surah 42.11 and Surah 112.4, it says that there's nothing like Allah and nothing can be compared to him. Mm -hmm. You know, they they allow that for themselves, but as soon as Christians start talking about things that, that at least stretch our reasoning abilities beyond uh, their natural limits, you know, as, as suddenly, and, and, and again, I mean, we're not saying here, we're not talking about a contradiction here, mm -hmm. we're just talking mm -hmm. about uh, the, the 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 difference the, the difficulty for us is we don't know of another being like that in our experience right it's not that there's anything contradictory mm -hmm. that that god is one in many is not contradictory there's no logical nobody who's studied logic would say there's a contradiction there mm -hmm. unless they don't know what it means mm -hmm. uh we're just saying that it it stretches our 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 ability to grasp because you know i, I don't bump into anyone like that on the streets mm -hmm. right but what does that mean? Well, it means there's no one like him, right? Yeah. There's nothing that can be compared to him. You know, why are Muslims complaining about that? Yeah. That's what their own text tries to say. Yeah. But well, at the end of the day, Allah isn't unlike everything, is he? He's just like every other being yeah. you've ever met. He's one person and very, uh, you know, th there's nothing difficult there to understand about Allah. Yeah, uh, but but going going back to uh, to uh, the phrase Bila Kaif, um, that would suggest that there is and that the, the early Muslim theologians uh, understood this, and I would just wanted to emphasize that point a bit more. That uh, it, the uh, Sunni theologians were using this response to the in, to the challenges of groups like the Mutazilites, who are pointing out how how can Allah's word be eternal? That would be some <laughs> other eternal <laughs> thing along with Allah, and the response was. <laughs> Bila Kaif, we can believe that it's true without without understanding how. Or yeah, questions David. about Allah's physical parts. How can Allah have all these physical parts if he's so different from his creation? Bila Kaif, we, we, we don't understand how. We, 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 we can say this without understanding how it could be true. And Muslims just don't know about any of this, right? You could go to... Um, you could go to any of the Muslims uh, that, that you that you run into normally. They have no idea that Islam even teaches these things. Their their leaders and scholars do not tell them these things, so that they think, oh, we've got this really simple concept of God. If you actually go to the theologians, they're saying it left and right. We have no idea how we can possibly understand this.
Yeah, and, and where does the Quran say uh, that the Quran is Allah's eternal word? Well, uh, I mean, well, it doesn't. Yeah, it's a conclusion. Which, which, yeah. by, by the way, uh, you know, by, I, I think I mentioned this at the at the debate, but you know, with with Muhammad Hijab, ah, show me where it says this, show me where it says that, show me where it says exactly this, and so on. You could use the exact same reasoning and say, uh, well, you know, show me where Muhammad said that, or show me where Allah said that. It's they allow us no place for actually reasoning and coming to a conclusion, right? You can't say, okay, here are these things that are said. And the obvious conclusion to draw is this, right? Because as soon as you say the conclusion to draw is this, then they say, aha, you invented that, right? Not realizing yeah. you just, that's an obvious conclusion from the data you have. Well, but then they'll turn right around and without having, without having a statement that says Allah's word is eternal or something like that, they'll conclude that based on some philosophical and theological reasoning, uh, not spotting the, not spotting, not spotting the, the, the contradiction there. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, and I think one of the reasons that Christians aren't necessarily good at it is not only because they don't necessarily know much about Islamic history and theological development, which they should, but also because, as we recognize, these arguments are pathetic, right? I mean, it's pathetic to say, where's this word used that labels a concept that can be found there? Unless you can find the word, then the concept isn't there. We don't think like that because that's a bad argument. And so we don't think oftentimes to to turn the, the the return the favor and say where does it say is the eternal word where does it say bilakai where does it say half a dozen other terms that Muslims use uh, in theology yeah you know, they they talk about akida I mean I'm not saying uh, yeah I mean they, they, there's just so many words that they use that aren't used in the Quran and they're they're not used in the Hadith Muhammad doesn't say them either uh, so yeah it's it, one problem after another. All right, well, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Did you want to continue this topic um, later? or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got a lot more we could say on it, uh, so I, I, we can do however you want it. You want to continue tomorrow night? Sure. All right, why don't you, uh, why don't you give us a little summary here? We've still got a couple minutes. Uh, well, some, sort of summarize what we have so far, and then maybe uh, where we'll go after this. Yeah, we, we've only scratched the surface, but we've already seen... Uh, Mostly from Genesis, and I, I actually skipped over a lot, but mostly from Genesis, though also in some other books of the Old Testament, how the Old Testament describes God using plural terms, personal terms, and further uh, identifies th that plurality in, in various ways, either by speaking of God and his spirit, or God and his word, or God, his word, and his spirit uh, in various passages. You have the plurals in Genesis 1.26, 3.22, 11.7, 7, Isaiah 6.8, uh, and you also have the divine distinction in Genesis 19.24, the Lord reigning from the Lord, or the passage in Hosea 1.7 where uh, it speaks of God saving the people by God, or the passage in Zechariah where uh, the Lord speaks of the Lord sending him. This sort of thing very clearly indicates that there's personal plurality in the Old Testament and goes some part of the way in defining what that plurality is, namely God, his word, and his spirit. And you also have uh, that one of those persons of the Godhead appearing in human form uh, to Abraham. All of this looks exactly like the sorts of things that you get in the New Testament and not at all like what you see in Islam. And so in future broadcasts, we'll discuss more of the evidence and also show you that this isn't just some uh, something that Christians are attributing to the Old Testament. Jewish people saw this as well. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, uh, a quick question I wanted to answer, and it's about uh, 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 Issa saying, uh, are you going to take questions from Super Chat? Well, we're, we're actually out of time now, but uh, we we wanted to get through some of this material and we only had an hour so uh, tonight we're not, and then uh, next time we will continue with this topic. But just so you know, we'll start having some. We'll start having some uh, somewhere we just take questions. So we'll actually have some live streams where we just uh, take questions from the uh, from the chat. Um, if we have a topic and we cover the topic, and then we have time for for some questions, then we'll we'll uh, we'll do that. But yeah, we we had a lot to get through. Uh, for this hour and probably the next the uh, the next live stream will will be uh, pretty full as well. But yeah, so we will we will be we will be taking uh, we will be taking uh, plenty of questions um, on future live streams. Uh, but so we what, what we have here is uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab uh, set up the, the Old Testament as 
uh, the authority, as, as the Quran uh, encourages him to do. Um, you can't contradict the Old Testament with your theology, but the Old Testament clearly indicates that there is a plurality within the nature of God. And so since Muhammad Hijab set that up as the authority, Islamic Unitarianism is false. That so far we haven't proved the doctrine of the Trinity, um, but so far we've already seen that Islam has to be false by the very standards of Muhammad Hijab. So uh, keep those things in mind. We'll be covering more because Muhammad Hijab, uh, in those brief comments, have given us uh, plenty of material to address uh, and respond to. So uh, uh, we'll see you again next time.